All righty, well, let's begin since we have a good group here and others can arrive. Uh, they'll, they'll just miss the boring preamble that I'm about to give. Uh, but I will be the last, first, last and only boring part of this whole thing. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Thomas. I'm the Vice President of Collaboration and Special Initiatives at San Diego Grantmakers. And we're so pleased to have you here today for our weekly funder and community update uh, on all of the interesting and important factors dealing with this COVID-19 crisis and the related impacts in our community. I do want to let you know that this session is being recorded. Uh, that means we will have it available for you and anyone you wish to share it with after the fact. Um, and it also means that uh, although all of our audience members are, are muted, anything that's said and all the questions that are asked will be uh, recorded and shared out publicly. Just want to make sure you know about that. Um, you are all muted if you are watching, um, and so please feel free to use the Q&A button on your screen and we'll see those questions and we'll be able to communicate those to our speakers and um, the folks that are sharing this webinar with us. And if you want to talk to one another, use that chat box. Feel free to share resources that you have, uh, say hello, tell us where you're joining from. Um, and do any other sort of conversation there. But if you use the Q&A button, it helps us stay organized. Otherwise, the questions tend to get lost in all of the chatter, uh, but we'll do our best to keep an eye on that. Um, so uh, one thing I just wanted to recognize is that wherever we are, if we're in San Diego County, we are on the traditional and unceded lands of the Kumeyaay people who are still today um, our neighbors and our friends and our colleagues uh, and share with us this uh, experience of being under under siege um, economic and and health wise and i was reading something earlier today uh, from the indian health service that was really lifting up and reminding us that um, the idea of healing and medicine comes in so many forms we're going to hear um, really incredible research today some of the um, life-saving uh, uh, progress that is so important but the idea of um, ritual and healing and family and togetherness um, is so important and doesn't just come in in the form of sort of western medicine and science and so i just wanted to um, lift that up and invite everybody uh, to hand this over for opening remarks to debbie to join me in a couple of breaths um, which is a little bit of of science and uh, and art uh, connecting with our body, with the earth, and just taking a pause before we dive into what's going to be very interesting um, uh, sharing here. So maybe together, find a comfortable spot, figure out where that tension is. We probably all have some in our body somewhere. And just take a breath, connecting across the airwaves here together, breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. <clears throat> Thank you. I know I forget to pause and I want to be fully present. And so with that, I'm pleased to hand uh, this over to Debbie McKeon, who is the president and CEO of San Diego Grantmakers to introduce the topic and welcome you here today. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you so much for giving us a space um, for us to be able to listen deeply today um, as we discuss this important topic. Welcome. On behalf of Philanthropy California, we're so pleased to be part of the statewide alliance, which is Northern California Grantmakers, Southern California Grantmakers, and San Diego Grantmakers. So thanks so much to all of you for joining us from all across the state. I'm especially excited for today's conversation. As for me, it's bringing rays of optimism to our situation. As we're discussing the search for effective treatments and cures to COVID-19 and philanthropy strategic investing that catalyze some of the work that we're about to discuss in a few minutes. So why is this conversation so relevant for us in California? It's because the heart of the biomedical research field is in California. Statewide Life Science Association of California, Biocom, is based in San Diego and has chapters throughout the state. In Scripps Research, also located in San Diego, whose president and leading research you're about to hear, 
is ranked one of the most influential institutions in the world for its impact on innovation. No more relevant than now as they lead an international search for effective treatments and cures to COVID-19. So how is it that Scripps Research found themselves in this position to lead and respond so quickly? I've gotten to know Pete Schultz, the president and CEO, and the work he leads, and I think you will hear it becomes clear that it isn't by accident. Pete, president of Scripps Research, is at the front of his field for a reason. He leads Scripps Research in solving the problems of today while also supporting innovations that better prepare us to solve problems that lie ahead. One of the things I've learned to admire about Pete is his ability to make the complex world of science accessible. As he explains, the driving forces of science are to see so that we can know. That really resonated with me. As Pete will share, it's philanthropy's trust and support in science and our scientists to help them see that led to support for the creation of a library of drugs. This library is fundamental to the pace at which Scripps is collaborating with colleagues around the globe and leading work to find solutions to COVID-19. As a nonprofit leader, Scripps Research is supported by a breadth of philanthropy and philanthropists. One of philanthropy's leading funders, a well-known colleague to Philanthropy California members, is the Gates Foundation. I'd just like to recognize that the Gates Foundation provided $50 million to support the creation of the library. With so many people participating in this program, and we're excited for that, that you're beaming in from where, whichever living room you're in at this time, as questions and comments arise, I just want to remind you to please put them in the Q&A section uh, so that they can be utilized to frame that portion of our conversation. Megan's going to be our guide for this section, so if you want to communicate with her individually for any reason, please do so um, through the chat. And now I'm really pleased to turn the screen and microphone over to Pete Schultz, President and CEO of Scripps Research, to introduce his colleagues and kick off this conversation. Welcome, Pete. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, if we could have the slides. Um, what Can I thought I'd do, um, before we get into the, the COVID work we're doing, what I thought I would do is just quickly overview Scripps for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, especially the vision of Scripps, because the vision we have is, is basically enabling our work in COVID and many other disease areas. And, and, and that vision is not only to, to, to have a tradition of outstanding basic research, but to do something that, that may be more transformative in the nonprofit sector and, and, and combine that outstanding basic research with an ability uh, to move that research and those discoveries into medicines that directly impact patients um, in the clinic. So we, we decided to combine our basic research enterprise with a translational research enterprise um, um, to accelerate the, the development of medicines for the public benefit. So with that is the goal in mind, next slide, um, just briefly, um, let's see. Uh, briefly about Scripps, it's one of the largest nonprofits in the US uh, research institute has everything from, covers everything from chemistry to neuroscience to immunology. We have a graduate program that's in the top 10. And uh, as was said, we, we've uh, uh, had a lot of innovative science, done a lot of innovative science in both technologies over the past 50 or so years. Um, and in fact, we aren't the only ones. It's next slide, it's the golden age of, of biology, we know more about human disease than ever in history. But for some reason, that knowledge um, and the translation of that knowledge to new medicines <laughs> has been slowed. And, and the question is why? And it's because discoveries are made in the nonprofit sector and drugs are made in the commercial sector. And there are barriers um, that are inherent to both and effectively couple the new science with the creation of new medicine. So we sought to overcome that, and next slide, the way we decided to do that was to try and build a nonprofit um, uh, drug discovery enterprise that, that had the same capabilities 
is most commercial um, drug discovery, um, um, uh, pharma and biotech. So we started that in 2012. Um, we built Caliber, we called it, as a nonprofit. It has a lot of collaborations with foundations, philanthropists, and pharma. And uh, on the next slide, we've built within Caliber all of the kinds of capabilities that one sees in, in, in a next slide in a, in a uh, large biotech or pharma. So we can do small molecule drug discovery, screens. We have millions of compounds in our, our libraries. We can do pharmacology, IND enabling studies, and now we're doing clinical studies on drugs that we've made that have come directly from Scripps discoveries. And so next slide, how well have we done with this? Um, uh, sorry, I, I should point out, that one key aspect of what we do, which will be obvious in all of our COVID work as well, is we collaborate with many individuals, not only throughout the United States, but throughout the world, who have biological and expertise and insights that can create new therapies and new approaches towards disease. And we combine that with our translational capabilities to, to, to accelerate the development of new therapeutics. Next slide. So how well have we done? Oh, I, I should point out, we, we uh, 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 combined Caliber with Scripps in 2018. And the idea there was to combine the creativity, talent, and, and investment in basic research at Scripps with the expertise and focus and processes in drug discovery at Caliber so that we could go all the way from the bench to the bedside. So that was really the theme. And we decided to do that by combining two nonprofit organizations, Scripps and Caliber, and I happen to be president of both, so it was pretty easy to do. So the question is, how well have we done? Next slide. And, and the answer is, we, we actually, this is our pipeline of later stage programs. We have three clinical stage programs, um, and we have, likely four to five more programs that will enter the clinic uh, in the next uh, 18 months. So, you know, a year and a half from now, we'll probably have eight to 10 uh, uh, molecules that, that were made in the nonprofit sector and in, 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 in directly impacting patients. And as a couple of examples, we have next slide. Uh, a regenerative therapy for osteoarthritis that basically grows new cartilage. And it, it doesn't slow the progression of the disease. Uh, we think it'll reverse osteoarthritis and repair the damage. So that's currently in patients in a phase one study. The next slide, we've created a, a novel approach towards cancer therapy, cell-based cancer therapy, that exploits what are called CAR T cells. And this is a cell-based therapy that, that has remarkable efficacy in people with, with refractory leukemias. Uh, technical issues and, and safety issues have prevented that from being applied to solid tumors like breast cancer, prostate cancer, and the like. And, and we think we've developed technologies that overcome those challenges. And right now, we're beginning to recruit patients in collaboration with Abby for uh, to test th this new therapy uh, in cancer patients. We've also, next slide, created uh, an immune-based therapy for prostate cancer. It's the second leading cancer in men, and when it metathesizes, there is no, no treatment. So again, we've created a T-cell recruiting strategy there. Next slide. And we have other programs ongoing as well. We have programs for neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS that are new approaches to treat the immune component of the disease. And we'll be starting to test these in patients in 2021. And on the next slide, we're also working closely um, on childhood diseases uh, with, for example, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, one of the leading children's hospitals, and we're working on developing new treatments for childhood rasopathies, which affect about one in every 3,000 children. Um, and we hope to actually be testing 
for those drugs in, in, in with Cincinnati in patients by the year's end. Next slide. So, so that's, and there are other opportunities. We, one relevant to COVID, we think we have a way to regenerate lung. So the damage that's caused not only by COPD and by fibrosis, but also by acute viral infections like COVID um, that damage the lung. We think we have an approach to repair lung. Next slide. And so, and we've created a pipeline of, of programs behind this. But importantly, um, early on, next slide, in, in, in the, the, the development of Caliber, we formed a partnership with the Gates Foundation. Um, and really to focus our capabilities, resources, and insights on to infectious diseases of the developing world. And we've already put two drugs in the clinic with the Gates Foundation, one for childhood diarrhea and one for, for TB. We have two more that are gonna enter the clinic hopefully by year's end, um, and then a pipeline behind that. One of the most exciting, next slide, was made by Arnab. It, it's, it's a new approach to the treatment and prevention of HIV where we've actually taken drugs that are used to treat HIV and with a, 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 a simple half mil injection, we think we can have drugs that, that treat or protect people for up to six months. So you get an injection twice a year, like a flu shot, and you're protected from uh, uh, HIV. So I think that would have a huge impact there. Next slide. So as we were, as we built all of these capabilities, um, next slide. Um, we, we decided, um, sorry, I think we're having problems with the slides. Oh, sorry. Uh, and we also have, so, so as we built all of these capabilities, um, we, we, with the Gates Foundation, um, we realized that when COVID-19 came around, we would be well positioned to tackle that immediately because we already had a large translational capability all the way to patients and we'd already made significant strides in, in creating new drugs, um, not only for infectious diseases, but other diseases that, that impact the global community. So we decided um, very quickly to turn our attention to COVID-19 in collaboration with the Gates Foundation. This has all been done as a collaborative effort. And we really focus on three areas, repurposing of known drugs, which Arnab will talk about, the design of COVID-19 vaccines, uh, which Dennis will talk about, and, and epidemiology studies, which, which have been ongoing by Christian Anderson. So at, that's, at this stage, that's kind of how we got to where we are with the ability to tackle COVID, and I wanted to highlight that. And now I'll turn it over to Arnav Chatterjee, who's our Vice President of Medicinal Chemistry, and he'll tell you about our repurposing efforts. Arnav? Thanks, Pete. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work that's ongoing um, in the lab. This really all started with uh, you know some, uh, some conversations I was having with uh, folks in China in the middle to late part of January was very clear that COVID-19 was a problem well beyond East Asia uh, and something that needed to be attacked globally. So uh, I'm really proud of all of the colleagues at Scripps, uh, including those who are on the call with me today about how we've tried to mobilize this around building, um, as, as Megan and Debbie pointed out, a kind of a global approach to this uh, problem, combining both the drug discovery and basic research, as Pete has outlined, is ongoing at Scripps. Um, the next slide has a little bit about what we've done around building of the reframe collection. So really, at the end of the day, uh, the purpose of showing you this is just to show that it takes a long time to generate a drug that can go from basic research all the way through to drug development. And many, many thousands of molecules, hundreds of thousands of molecules are made in programs that I have been involved in that have entered the clinic and drugs that eventually make it through to something that's available in a pharmacy. So we were thinking, how could one tradition break down this timeline, the time barrier of 10 plus years, 15 years, to be able to get to small molecules 
to be able to treat something that is a clear and present and immediate danger like COVID-19. So on the next slide, please, shows what we've done to try to address that, which is what we call the reframe library. And again, this was a collaboration with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, really trying to answer one very simple question, which is if we were faced with a situation where we had a pathogen of interest, in this case, say COVID-19, but in fact, we've done this also for flu and for TB and cryptosporidium and some of the other examples Pete gave, and put together a collection of every small molecule, as many as we could, not just buy the ones that you can buy, but also make the ones that are unavailable commercially or ones that made it into clinical trials, but didn't make it to a pharmacy for commercial reasons or for other reasons why the molecule did not progress, put them all in a collection, make that collection available to anyone in the world to screen free of charge. And the only requirement out of all of this is that the data is immediately put into the public domain. Intellectual property can be owned by the person making doing the screen, but the data has to be available in real time for folks to be able to use. And so this 12,000 compound collection of reframe really allows us to accelerate going from screens, and in most cases, screening thousands of compounds, while it sounds very difficult, in the modern age of drug screening is something that many labs can do. So mobilizing this collection has been critical to being able to try to get to something for COVID-19. Next slide, please. Here, I just really show the concept and really, I think, you know, the idea here, as Pete alluded to a long time ago, is we're really trying to democratize drug discovery, which is instead of a biologist or a clinician having to know a chemist like myself or Pete to say, please make me these drug molecules so I can test them. What if you had the collection available for everyone to be able to use, taking together multiple different drug collections, both the data around drugs that have been dosed in humans and the physical samples that you can share with those people to be able to test. And the point of this slide is really to show that these drugs were developed for many, many different diseases, but to repurpose them, meaning to use them in a completely new indication, a new disease area, something like COVID-19, you need to make the collection available to people and be able to do tens of thousands of screens, of which we've done several hundred already using this collection just in the last couple of years. Next slide, please. So that kind of how, uh, outlines kind of what we've been doing at Scripps. And, and, and the purpose of this slide is really just to show the breadth of what the reframe collection can do in terms of not just generating molecules like on the left-hand side that have entered clinical trials based on discoveries of this collection, but also the, the large pipeline of drugs that are behind it. Drugs that simply were not imagined could be used in new disease indications, which we are now moving forward. Next slide, please. Here really just shows just what we've mobilized just in the last three months. All of those labs on the upper left-hand side is a real global effort. I'll call out the University of Hong Kong, which has been where we published just some of our work on Friday in collaboration with Suma Chanda, the Sanford Burnham here locally as well, to be able to run a screen on some of the very first patient isolates from patients in Wuhan who were having COVID-19, SARS coronavirus 2 infections, and be able to screen them. And now you can see that we've expanded that collection dramatically, including both resources, both for in vivo testing, meaning testing them in animal models, as well as potential clinical trial investigators to be able to move these forward. And again, it's a collaboration of many people at Scripps uh, and at Caliber, but also many other people around the world to really address many different parts of what we now know more and more every day, every minute, new biology around the SARS-CoV-2 virus, what cells, what patients, what are some of the preconditions, what are some of the things that we can learn about the basic biology, but apply them very quickly with the set of molecules that we can quickly test in humans. Next slide, please. On this slide just shows, again, many of the many collaborators around the world, David Ho, for example, at Columbia and others have reached out to us and we've made the collection available to anyone who's asked us to screen the collection. Next slide. So this looks at really whole virus, and the next one really shows the specific biological targets of which Dennis and his lab will talk about. But what's really provided a lot of power uh, to this approach is on the next slide, which shows we've been able to generate a screening system with Tom Rogers and Melina Bukowski at Scripps uh, in the immunology department, as well as with Dennis's lab, and also at Caliber to generate a screen where we're testing human cells and looking for molecules that can block viral propagation, the growth of the virus, in the host cell. 
in this is in a human system. So no other, uh, uh, no other things to point out other than the fact that we can quickly image the virus growing inside of a cell and at the same time determine if the host cell is being affected because we clearly don't want to affect the natural function of the cell, simply the ability for the SARS-CoV-2 virus to propagate. Next slide, please. And this slide shows just some of the few hits. These were some of the early stage hits that we had. And I just wanted to highlight that several of all of these on this slide have been generated for safety in humans. Many of them have entered clinical trials, as you can see, and we're now doing follow-up studies to really understand the biology of these. We've published some of this work as of late last week uh, in bioarchives, and we're hoping to publish the screener on the AEC2 work this week as well, to really be able to show to the world that not only can we run these screens, but share the data in real time so we can address the key unmet needs of COVID-19 infection. Next slide, please. This again just shows one of the other things we want to do. I'm sure many of you have heard about remdesivir, which is the Gilead molecule, which was uh, used for Ebola infections and now is being looked at very closely, <laughs> very, very closely in SARS-CoV-2 infections and COVID-19. One of the things we wanted to do is really understand of these new molecules that we found that directly block virus replication in human cells, can they be used in combination? with remdesivir appropriately? Can they lower the dose of remdesivir? Can you get greater effective remdesivir by adding on top of it a new compound of which you can see many approved molecules in this list, five to six really interesting approved molecules that are used in different disease indications like hepatitis C, HIV, and also as anti-inflammatories. Next slide, please. So really here, as I can show, we've got a very, very large number of molecules to work our way through. Uh, and I'm very excited to show that there's a possibility of five to six of these molecules that we can move quickly into clinical trials, not just for treatment, but also the larger end game around potential small molecule prophylaxis as we're actively working on vaccines and other ways of being able to address longer term needs. These molecules could also potentially be used for preventing folks from getting infection, particularly in households that have members who are COVID-2 positive. Next slide, please. And so again, it comes from, again, the ability to build bridges, something that we've been able to build very quickly for this infection. All of the companies shown on the right-hand side have all agreed to apply molecules. These are all major drug discovery groups. And while we know many of the molecules that they have uh, put into clinical trials that we have get garnered through public data sources, they also have access to molecules that we don't know about. And screening those compound collections is, is really important. And in fact, we're already happy to report that the cell gene group here in San Diego has sent us molecules we've already sent them back data on some 700 molecules they've sent to us for screening against SARS-CoV-2 in the human system. Next slide, please. The next set of slides is for Dennis, but my point is that the small molecule drug discovery collections here can provide really interesting points for clinical investigations as well as further uh, understanding of the disease biology of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Thanks. And this is Pete, just to introduce Dennis. Dennis is chair of our uh, immunology department, and Dennis has led the largest uh, rational vaccine design effort in the nonprofit sector with, with uh, vaccines uh, now in clinical trials um, uh, for AIDS, and also he's developing vaccines uh, uh, for, for uh, influenza, potential in influenza, influenza, pan influenza pandemic. So, Dennis, it's all yours. Yeah, thanks, Pete. So, um, yeah, just to say that we have a, about a dozen laboratories at uh, Scripps that work on these problems, particularly HIV, but also uh, flu. Hey, Dennis, maybe you could get a little closer to the mic on your computer. Oh, um, I'm pretty much on top of it. How is that? That's great. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, there's about a dozen laboratories working on HIV primarily, but also um, flu and uh, malaria, antibodies and um, vaccines, particularly the vaccines um, aspect. And so we have a lot of tools in place and a lot of know-how. And so um, with the advent of uh, COVID-19, we've switched a lot of efforts to um, working on that. So and I'm just going to tell you very briefly about that in a, a fairly a straightforward manner. But um, what I'm going to begin with is um, a bit of a primer on um, 
uh, viruses, antibodies, vaccines, I think it's important to make one or two um, distinctions here. So the next slide um, and the first click just shows you, oh, no, uh, yeah, thank you. So if we just look at the first time you get infected with a virus, and this, this is what happens with um, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the vaccine that causes, uh, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, then uh, what happens is the following. So the first click will show you what happens. You, you get infected uh, at the bottom there, and what happens is the virus starts multiplying um, uh, exponentially in your cells, it damages cells, it leads to tissue damage, it leads to illness. And um, you know, the viral load goes up, and if it just keeps going up, then you know, you're in real trouble. But what generally happens is that immunity kicks in and uh, the viral load is um, brought down again, and eventually you resolve the infection and uh, off you go. Now, how does that happen? So the next clip, one of, the, uh, one of the first things that happens is that we all have in ourselves all sorts of mechanisms that resolve uh, And that in itself can uh, lead or certainly contribute strongly to resolution of infection. The next clip, however, what can also happen is that innate response, as it's called, can go on for too long and it can start then you can start to get tissue damage not just from the virus but from your own uh, immune system and um, that seems to be what happens in, in uh, COVID-19 you get infected you get the symptoms from the virus for about a week and then hopefully you're fine if you're not then you'll start to see a second wave of symptoms coming on uh, particularly from um, uh, the immune system tap on, on, on your own uh, tissues. Now, the innate response is one response. The next clip shows you um, what's usually very important in resolving an initial first infection is what's called the T-cell response, which is cells that are white blood cells that recognize or, or, or scan for infected cells and eliminate. And there's a certain amount of memory in those cells so that to a certain degree they can protect you in the future. The next clip shows you that as the virus multiplies it makes lots of material, foreign material, that antibodies are um, uh, set up to recognize. So now you make uh, a large number of binding antibodies. And these are the antibodies that actually we generally use in diagnosis. To make them up relatively quickly, uh, the, the antibody response. And so when you hear about antibody tests, that's what we're usually talking about. And you can see that the viral load is detected first by PCR, and the antibody is somewhat later. But then, next clip, you have another response which is the antibodies that actually work to protect you against virus. And those are called neutralizing antibodies. I'll say a little more in a moment. And those antibodies are what generally provide you with immunity. And those antibodies are generally uh, what we're trying to induce through um, vaccination. So that's, that's a kind of quick primer. If we go, if we look in the next slide at, um, Next slide, please. Um, so let's just look at those what antibodies. And you've probably seen these many times, this kind of Y-shaped uh, protein. And they're, they're the key to resisting reinfection. That's why generally we don't get infected with the same bug twice. And they're also the key to vaccines. And the, uh, there are a number of important features. They recognize shapes. So, um, the, the, so what that what that means is what is highly significant there is they have to distinguish the shapes of the proteins that are foreign from those of your, your own body. And they do that. And they pick up on the on, uh, foreign shapes as they um, appear. And of course, this is the whole basis of vaccination because 
if you give a person a given a protein with a given traits on it, you'll make antibodies. And the, the, the body doesn't know whether those shapes were on pathogen or on something else or in what form they were. And so vaccines work by presenting shapes in non-deadly forms, like inactivated viruses, attenuated viruses, or proteins from the surface of the body. And then it turns out that antibodies can improve with more contact with the shape. So it takes a while to get really good antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, maybe two, three months. So they're not really so much involved in the initial stages of a new virus, but they will come up slowly to protect you against the next time. And hopefully we have long-term memory. So yellow fever, for example, if you have yellow fever, you will still have to be making antibodies against that 60 again, generally. So those are the key features of antibodies. Now, if we look at the virus that we're talking about here, next slide. Next slide, please. There is the virus on the left-hand side. And what you'll see is that in the red there is the genetic material. That's the whole basis of the virus. The virus wants to get that genetic material, inject it into your cells, so that your cells are taken over, and uh, instead of doing what they should do, they make virus particles, and lots of them, and very quickly. So that's, so that's the particle that we want to stop, and it's covered in this membrane in yellow, and on the And those spike proteins are what the virus uses to attach to target cells, your cells. And what we want to do is to stop those spike proteins binding your cells. And that's what the antibodies do. Next slide shows you um, to scale uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 with uh, antibodies now beginning to bind to the um, spike protein, the red S protein. And when they coat the virus, the virus can no longer get into your cells. And the next slide just gives you a better view of a couple of spikes. You can see the antibodies are quite large and they really gum up the works in the, the, the virus trying to get into your cells. The next slide, um, now we get on to the two topics, uh, vaccines and uh, antibodies. And so I'll just tell you a little bit about what's happening with uh, COVID vaccines and then uh, on one slide what we're doing, which is somewhat different. So all vaccines that are based on inducing neutralizing antibodies, what their, their aim is, is to present to the antibody system the S protein. So if you look at the top there, and you'll see little S's drawn uh, down there. Um, so that's what the, 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 the vaccines are about. Now the first two vaccines are um, use genetic material to uh, the genetic material has been prepared with a gene for the S protein in it. And what the hope is that they're injected into you and um, that they then enter your cells and then you and once the S protein comes out antibodies start to um, uh, be, be, be made against the S protein, okay? And that is a very rapid way to do a vaccine because you just need to make genes. And that's why you'll see that Moderna and Inovio have uh, these vaccines already in people because they're using genetic uh, uh, systems. An alternative is to actually make the protein and put that in. And that is, uh, takes longer, but that's another way to do it. Another, uh, another way, uh, the brown there, is to take um, a harmless uh, virus that can infect your cells, but it clone into it the uh, SARS-CoV-2 S protein and get that virus to infect you and make S protein in that way. And that's some of the most promising vac uh, vaccines that we'll hear about, something called Adenovirus 26 or VSV, those are two uh, different vector vaccines. 
or you could go to the old ways, which is an inactivated vaccine or a live attenuator. The latter, you've got to be very careful. And both of those bottom two were, for example, the how polio vaccines were made, you know, the salt vaccine and the live attenuator. But those tend to be less favoured these days. Um, there are more safety issues with them. Sort of so, those are the, the vaccines that are currently being tried. The next uh, click will show you um, the, uh, the process that's involved here. And everyone asks how long to a vaccine. And the true answer is we don't know. Um, it depends upon how many problems are encountered on the way. The RNA vaccine is in people now. If everything went totally according to plan, you know, it's possible there could be a vaccine, maybe not in, enough, enough, enough amount to um, vaccinate the whole, let's say, of the country, but there would be um, a pretty good indication of a vaccine working to have vaccinated large numbers of uh, people. If everything went totally according to plan, usually it doesn't. So these are the steps that are involved generally, but you have to make this stuff in um, GMP, good manufacturing practice, you know, and sterile and so on. And normally you would have clinical trials, you would do it in a small number of people, make sure it's safe, go to a larger number, and then a much larger number. And look at, um, in the phase three, two and three, you'd start to look at efficacy. Did vaccine protect? Um, and eventually it would be licensed. The chances are with a critical a situation like this, some of these steps will have no well been uh, skipped or short. The FDA in this country needs to approve. And then, and this is going to take time, you've got to make the thing in, in large scale. But this is why, you know, when people say we'll have a vaccine by August, you know that can't be true because you can't make large scale uh, in, in that sort of and then it's administered, and you've got to wait for the antibodies to be made, and then hopefully you will have um, immunity. And if everything goes well, then it might well be one year to between one and two years, let's say. Um, but the next slide, but in, in many cases, the, uh, the I showed the S protein and the SARS CoV 2, these proteins they they often present their own particular problems and they don't make it easy to generate antibodies to them. The classic case is HIV, where we still don't have a vaccine 30 years or longer. Right? The reason is simply because of the, um, the complexity of that uh, surface viral protein. And then we have proposed an a, a totally alternate route to vaccines, which we call reverse vaccinology because we try and drive things in the opposite direction. So what we do is, we, we, we look at infected individuals, we isolate from them antibodies, because they all, soon some individuals will always make somewhat protective antibodies. We, um, we then study them, we then realize that we're just talking about antibodies recognizing shapes. This all sounds easy, but it's not, it takes a long time. And then we have to uh, take those shapes and put them in some sort of form that we can use to vaccinate. And um, if we do that and combine the shapes, then we can generate um, vaccines so that we now put those, if you go over to the left hand side, um, into uh, infected in the uninfected individuals, and they now make protective antibodies. And that's a kind of longer term uh, plan B that we are operating under in case the, the, the most straightforward and simple approaches don't work. Either that they don't work or they give us short term uh, protection. And another thing here, well, I'll, I'll do this on the next slide. So, the next slide um, just um, considers antibodies as drugs. So, in our vaccine efforts, we're making potent antibodies. And um, so what we can do is we can take those antibodies directly. These are monoclonal antibodies and we can use them either to treat 
or we can use them as prophylactics. So we could give people uh, antibodies, uh, for example, healthcare workers, and they would be uh, protected. The alternative that's being done now before monoclonal antibodies are isolated, monoclonal antibodies are familiar with that, uh, much used in, in uh, cancer and in um, autoimmune therapies. Um, the alternative is to isolate antibodies from individual patients who have recovered. I mean, that's a big effort. You've got to lead them, you've got to purify the antibodies, and you don't get as much uh, bang for your buck at all. So the far more sophisticated, the better long-term effects make the And then, what we are trying to do particularly is to take this beyond the um, SARS-CoV-2. So we've already found antibodies that cross-react between SARS-CoV-2 and the original SARS virus from 2003. And um, so this tells us that there are such things as cross-reactive, broadly neutralizing antibodies. And we are particularly interested in those in the hope that we can use them not just against this um, outbreak, but against new emerging coronaviruses. And we think that that's, you know, should be looked at very strongly because there's going to be more of these, you know, maybe not now, maybe not in the next 20 years, but, you know, let's put in the effort now to try and um, uh, select the antibodies that would protect us generally. And if we could make the antibodies, then in principle we should be able to make a vaccine through the reverse vaccinology approach we described. So that's what we're doing. We're looking to um, make antibodies and vaccines for SARS-CoV-2, but we're also looking down the road and trying to generate pan antivirus antibodies and vaccines. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Mary, could you do the next the next slide? So, so we'll just finish up. We, we've gone a little longer than we planned. Um, just to briefly, we also have a large effort in gen genomic epidemiology, and, and that means using genomics uh, and genetic information to track the spread of diseases. And Christian Anderson has built a, a large program around that, initially looking at Ebola and, and, and uh, Zika and West Nile but has applied that now um, in collaboration with, with a worldwide network to look at the spread of, of COVID. Um, and, and actually he was the, the one to show that, that COVID actually originated through from natural origins. Um, it wasn't engineered. And next slide, um, they have an ongoing collaboration with Rady uh, Children's Hospital to look at how the virus is being spread among healthcare workers um, and to see whether there are better ways to limit um, uh, the exposure uh, and, and the spread of, of the virus among you know, essential healthcare workers. And, and finally, on the last slide, um, I think uh, the, 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 the uh, I think one can, as bad as COVID-19 is, it's a warning shot across our bow. I think it's likely there are going to be other pandemics, and the next one could be even worse. Um, but it's very likely there are going to be other pandemic viral uh, outbreaks. And so we're talking with the Gates folks and others about setting up a, a pandemic, a new drug discovery center for pandemic response, not only to COVID-19, but also to future pandemics. And as part of that, we'll put Reframe in, but all of these other collections RNAV described that we're getting from pharmaceutical companies and begin to proactively profile those compounds against other viruses and virus families. So when the next pandemic does come, we can respond even more rapidly and more rapidly, not only with known drugs, but drugs that, that may be at a late stage preclinical, they can be repositioned rapidly and put into the clinic for, for, for the next pandemic. So that's a summary of what we're doing. Um, and I think uh, we're happy, uh, we've gone a little over, but we're happy to open up to questions. 
Great. Thank you all so very much. Um, I'm just going to leave that slide up there for now because I think that's an exciting look into the future of, um, you know, we like to think about the, the urgent need uh, of people uh, and our, our neighbors today, but also understanding what can we learn and how do we build a stronger foundation to respond to challenges tomorrow. And knowing that you all work in a, a nonprofit um, environment and we have a number of uh, philanthropic funders and nonprofit folks on with us today. Now, I want to thank uh, uh, the folks who are submitting their questions. Gary, thank you, and Claire. Um, I'm going to take Gary's question, uh, which was about. Uh, I'll read it in a moment because it, it's, it names a name that I don't know. You probably all will know who this is, um, but I want to wrap it up also in a second question. And Gary says, Dr. Anderson, I couldn't figure out who that was. Dr. Anderson was pessimistic, pessimistic about finding a vaccine before three to four years, and you seem to think that might come sooner. And what, where do you see is the source maybe for that um, difference of opinion? Which gets to the heart of people really uh, wanting to know, especially you know, people who are concerned for their families and their friends, people who are on the front lines as medical professionals or in our service industries, uh, what are we gonna do? Uh, you know, when can we get out of our houses and feel more comfortable in the community? And I think uh, for the folks on this call uh, webinar, uh, there's also a question of um, what are those phases and who's gonna have access to them? Uh, right away. If we have a vaccine in four years, that's maybe a different story, but even six months from now, what do we do in between? Uh, what are those therapeutic treatments going to look like and, and how do we get to them? Um, and so maybe whichever of you wants to address any piece of that uh, in terms of the timing, the difference in the scientific community about what that looks like and um, how we're then going to be able to give people answers in the community knowing that for some folks going to a doctor is easy uh, and for others it's it's a different story. Uh, Dennis? Yeah I mean I can uh, actually Christian was asking me this morning um, how long it's going to take to get a vaccine so I mean four years it, it is definitely possible it's definitely possible if there is um, you know, difficulties with this uh, S protein, it could extend out there. Equally, you know, it could happen quite quickly. And, you know, we might have one in year 18 months. It, it, it is possible. We, you know, the true answer is we just don't know. We just need um, more data uh, uh, from humans. We, we need data on, on, on responses to these uh, vaccines and we need data on how what levels of antibodies we need um, and how long these vaccines work for. And, uh, you know, we're just going to have to do it. So we, we can't, we, we can't, you know. I'm sure Christian did say it's possible that it's for, but it's equally possible that it's not. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question here from, uh, from Kathy asking if it would be valuable for nonprofits to start now partnering with health organizations to more broadly uh, make screening and testing um, accessible. Would that contribute to the research that you're doing or, or to the ability to distribute uh, treatments and vaccines once you get there? Um. I, I think uh, we we don't have diagnostics uh, ongoing ourselves, but I think, and, and I think there are a lot of diagnostics being developed already in the nonprofit and for-profit sectors, commercial sectors. So I think I think that linkage has already occurred um, for those people who, who who in the academic community who. who create diagnostics, either DNA-based diagnostics or antibody-based diagnostics. So, so I do think that's happening, and clearly uh, that's a huge, huge need that complements um, uh, uh, developing vaccines and drugs. Great. Yeah, and we heard um, recently from one of our health clinics uh, um, done in San Isidro, about how they're trying to help just get information out to people uh, so that they understand what's being done where um, they can put their trust because we know that scientists uh, when you uh, uh, survey 
folks, just, you know, average individual folks out in the community, even in times of uh, plenty and of health, scientists are at the very top of the list of who is trusted. Uh, and nonprofits rank very high on the institutional um, uh, uh, ranking as well. And so it, it's encouraging to know that science and the nonprofit community are coming together to find answers. Uh, Claire, I know that we didn't get to your questions, and Lisa, thank you so much. I will pass those along to see if we can get you some answers um, offline, but I want to make sure that we're mindful of the time here. And uh, go ahead and bring Debbie McKeon back to uh, close us out um, and express thanks. Thank you, everybody, so much for your time today. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you, Pete, Arnab, and Dennis um, for really sharing what's at the front of the field um, for our hope, not only for the situation that we're in today, but I so appreciated it, Meg, as Megan said, sharing with us um, your thinking and your leadership uh, for the new Distru drug discovery center that will really prepare us for the future. Um, I, as I was thinking about uh, your principles that you're talking about collaboration and innovation, democratizing drug discovery, I think those values are so aligned with uh, the values of those of us on the phone that um, we really appreciate that you shared that with us and how you're using those values and those lens to lean in at this urgent time of need and how you've really brought together a global community to look at solving these problems. So I'm very proud to be a Californian and to have um, all of you be here as my neighbors. And, uh, and to know the leadership that you're presenting uh, on behalf of all of us across the world. I would like to just give Pete an opportunity to give some closing remarks be before we say goodbye. Yeah, I think, I think uh, we, uh, what, what I've seen in the whole COVID-19 um, uh, outbreak is that the scientific community it has really come together. Um, you know, we've had tremendous discussions, not only with other nonprofits and everybody sharing data, but with also commercial partners of providing drugs that you wouldn't believe that they would ever provide to, to, to nonprofits to test. So, so the entire scientific community has is, is come together, but I, I also think that the scientific community has come together with, with the, the larger global community because we see so many people wanting to, to figure out how they can help impact uh, uh, this disease. So, it, it, you know, there's a silver lining in this uh, of people working together. And, and I, I, you know, I think we're optimistic that 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 kind of attitude will prepare us better for the next time this happens. I, I do want to say in response to your question about where do you get information, we, we've actually built a website that, that puts all of the information that, that we have and that relates to um, many different aspects of COVID-19 and a website so that it's easily accessed by the community. And I think I think uh, Meredith or somebody can share that that uh, address. Um, it's on the last slide if you wanted to put that up just so people can copy it down. But uh, uh, And we thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Pete. Uh, we do uh, actually send out information to everyone who registered, so we'll be sure to send you the link. Um, so that you get connected to all the resources that were presented today. Thanks again, everyone, and continue to have a good day. Be safe, be well, and we look forward to talking to you again. Goodbye.